Good afternoon, everyone. I'm David Porter. I'll be talking about integrity uh, implant system and its use for rotator cuff repair augmentation. This implant is, is brand new, and I'll give you a little bit of a background on rotator cuffs. We'll go through it, and I'll explain to you exactly why we're using this implant. So there's about, about 300,000 rotator cuffs rep uh, annually reported in the United States. Retear rates upwards of about 30%. We also know that partial thickness tears are about as twice as common as uh, full thickness tears. And in this uh, market, there's, we use about $150 million worth of uh, augmentation products per year with 7% annually increasing. Types of rotator cuff uh, tears sort of vary, for, uh, you know, run the gamut from severe tendinosis and low grade partial tears to full thickness tears. And we know through the literature that many of these progress from either low grade to high grade or from high grade to full, full thickness. And when we look at them again, large tears requiring repair have a significantly high, higher rate of re-tear than we would typically expect at about 40%. So there's hot off the press, there's just a recent article, level one randomized controlled trial, looking at augmentation of rotator cuff full thickness repairs. Uh, with a bioinductive collagen implant. And this study showed that at one year, uh, for medium to large tears, there was a reduction in re-tear by about two thirds. Pretty important. So what Annika has done is developed this new implant, which is not a collagen implant. It's actually a, hy a hyaluronic acid uh, based scaffold. Um, and this is kind of the, uh, the profile of it, what it comes with. It's a delivery device for a bone staple, uh, has a tack delivery device, cannula, and it's a caddy with the implant. Implants at the bottom right. It almost feels as like a pocket square. That's the, the type of material it is. It's very uh, malleable. And why do we like it? Well, multiple reasons. One is it's reliable strength. Like I said, it's almost like a pocket square. You can kind of pull on it. It doesn't rip. Um, it has a high tensile strength, has higher suture uh, retention and tear resistance, um, and also its regenerative biology because it is a hyaluronic acid-based scaffold, it allows for improved cell infiltration and tissue remodeling. Indications for use, pretty straightforward rotator cuff repairs, both high grades, low grades for some patients, and full thickness tears as well that are repaired uh, with a single or double row. And when we look at hyaluronic acid overall, um, it is present throughout the body, 15 grams in your body. It, it is very involved in extracellular matrix. Um, it is naturally occurring glycosaminoglycan. It's, it's in joints, in skin. Um, it's pretty much in everything these days, from face washes to my wife's lip filler, you name it, uh, it's there. So the biological role of this hyaluronic acid um, essentially, at the cellular level, we see that it modulates inflammation and healing. We see it used in uh, products for knees, arthritis. Uh, we also see it at a macroscopic level in the growth and development of new tissue and new cells. So what this company has done is created a hyaluronic uh, acid uh, product, a serified mo uh, molecule, which is called HIAF11. This molecule, unlike hi um, hyaluronic acid, is insoluble in water. It doesn't get broken down as easily as uh, hyaluronic acid does. And we're able to process it as, like a, as a solid. We're able to mold it into a sort of like a textile, like I said, almost like a pocket square. And because of this, we're able to, uh, we have developed this, uh, this implant. HIF in practice has been used for, for years and there's been multiple studies on its efficacy. Um, 40, 40 more clinical studies on it uh, with excellent results over the past 20 to 30 years. So um, pretty good data. This is the implant here. And um, again, 80% of it is this high AF material, this hyaluronic acid. 20% is PET, which is essentially a polyethylene found in uh, sutures, et cetera. Um, it is a flexible knitted structure, uh, provides again, high tensile strength very high tear resistance. It doesn't really rip through when you put the tacks in um, and you're able to, to sort of uh, mobilize the, the tissue while it's in there. 
Again, also of note, compared to its competitor, it's much thinner. It's 0.75 millimeters versus one to two millimeters in thickness. This is what it looks like on under a high uh, uh, mi mi microscopy. You can see it's in like a lock stitch con uh, construction. Uh, there is uh, interwoven HIAF and PET, and some of it is color coded as well. Also of note with this implant, compared to Regenitin, which is um, uh, a collagen implant, there's a much higher um, porosity and the ability for cells to infiltrate through this material is much higher than uh, its leading competitor. Healing process with anything goes through three phases. It goes from an inflammatory phase to a proliferation phase to a remodeling phase. Um, and not to bring back bad memories of med school, but essentially the in inflammatory phase is kind of when the, the cells and macrophages infiltrate the area. A lot of growth factors are released. And finally, in, in this case, we like collagen to be uh, produced. So what did we do? We basically took the same uh, study that was used for Regenitin um, patch. And in, within sheep, we made partial rotator cuff tears. And we, for some of them, we put in a integrity patch. For some of them, we put in a, a uh, Regenitin patch. This is what it looked like. There were 50% partial thickness tears. On the left, we have the integrity implant. On the right, we have the Regenitin implant. And what did we see? So essentially, at six weeks, both are being actively resorbed. They're both doing their job. A little bit less cellular infiltration on the Regenitin patch compared to the uh, integrity patch, but both, both doing all right. At the 12-week mark is when we see a significant difference. Um, on the bottom left is the integrity. You can see it demonstrates a, lots of macrophage activity, um, lots of fibroblasts, new nuclei scattered throughout. You can see the black triangles um, and a lot of collagen. On the right, you can see it's a little bit more striated. Uh, the regenitin is basically complete, almost completely resorbed at this time. Um, and so there's really no more regenerative capacity at this three month mark as compared to the integrity. Um, and again, at 26 weeks, we still see that the integrity is almost essentially resorbed. It's still working. There's an extensive collagen uh, fibrous uh, network. Um, and the regenerative has been completely resorbed at this time. There's some, uh, some integration, but not a whole lot with regards to the, the, the collagen. This slide shows collagen staining blue. Uh, the integrity patch, as you can see on top, at 26 weeks has a, uh, a much thicker um, collagen than compared, uh, compared to the Regenitin patch, which is on the bottom right. And when we looked at this you know, preclinically, we could see that there was about three times as much collagen on the integrity compared to its competitor. Also, head to head, we compare these two uh, these two implants, and the tensile strength was much higher and almost over three times more uh, suture retention strength and tear resistance uh, compared to the Regenitin patch. So this is kind of what it looks like. Um, uh, essentially, uh, the patch is delivered on this staple, deli staple delivery tool, which uh, holds the implant and the bone staple. Uh, it's implanted in a lateral first fashion. So you put it in laterally and then you roll the implant over the rotator cuff repair immediately and, re and attach it with some uh, PLGA tacks. This is the TAC delivery tool, um, very similar to some of its competitors. It's a single time uh, to, to load the tacks. There's only a, uh, you know, it's, it's um, one tack with multiple prongs, pretty easy to use. And this is the implant caddy. It comes with uh, 12 different tacks, two different sizes, two different bone staples, which are peak. And this is what the staple looks like. Um, so this is a peak staple. Again, it's a lateral fixation first. There's multiple fins on the, uh, on the staple. Very strong, very good pullout strength. The tacks also, um, again, have multiple thick points of fixation, both proximally and distally. Unlike the Regenitin um, staples, which are PLLA, these tacks are, are made of PLGA and have a really, really low uh, uh, infl inflammatory um, profile. Um, 
And this is kind of what it looks like after it's implanted. You can use more than a few uh, uh, tacks, but this is kind of what it looks like. So what are my indications for this? I think it's pretty, pretty straightforward. I use it for partial rotator cuff tears. Um, I uh, generally use it for augmentation of repairs that are in older patients or degenerative tears. I also use it for subscapularis augmentation in uh, total shoulders and reverse shoulders. I think it also can be eventually used for, um, you know, uh, Achilles repairs, quad repairs, but for the fo focus of this, we're focusing on the shoulder. What is my rationale for this? Again, we've spoken about this, but for me, partial thickness tears progress. There's increased intratendinous strain, which leads to tissue degradation and uh, tear enlargement. Um, I followed a lot of my partials and a lot of them that do not get better. Typically uh, with a repeat MRI, I see that they, the, the tear tends to progress uh, significantly. So um, my surgical experience with these, again, limited. It's on a limited market release, this implant as of now, but I've done about 19 of these so far. Uh, I've used 13 of them for partial rotator cuff uh, tears, uh, and six of them have been for augmentation. And, and why do I like this? You know, I, I was a big user of some of the other uh, implants. I find it extremely easy to deploy this graft. I think the lateral first makes it very easy to ensure that there's coverage of your repair if you're doing it for rotator cuff augmentation. Um, I, I like the PLG8 tax. I haven't had any inflammatory reactions with them so far. And the ability to manipulate the graft, as you'll see in my, in my talk, uh, the next few slides, um, it makes it very easy to manipulate it um, and not tear the graft. So I'm just gonna present two quick cases. Uh, we've got about seven minutes left. So this was a 55 year old male, um, the history of right shoulder pain, uh, particularly with lifting weights, fairly in shape guy. He had failed three months of physical therapy and a cortisone injection. Uh, his MRI showed a partial articular surface tear of the posterior aspect of the supraspinatus uh, with subacromial bursitis. And this is the, um, these are the videos. So on the left here, we have, uh, this is just showing intraarticular look at the joint and the, the partial tear. I tend to probe most of these with a spinal needle just to, just to find the tear, see how thick the tissue is at that point. Also makes it easier to find the tear later on when I go above. So that was pretty easy. It was probably a mo moderate to high grade tear. Um, and for this one, what I did was, this is me in implanting the, the, the uh, uh, integrity patch. I use a, a um, spinal needle to hold the, the uh, tissue, in, the, the uh, scaffold in place. And this is just me using some of the, um, the tacks. Now you can see, again, I'm able to manipulate this graft much easier than some of the other grafts on the, or uh, tissues on the market. Um, and it doesn't tear, it doesn't rip. Fairly easy to use um, and easy to uh, mobilize. The second case, this is a 70 year old male, slip and fall six months ago with weakness. Um, MRI demonstrated a high grade or full thickness a supraspinatus tear um, with a type two labral tear. So for this, my plan was a rotator cuff repair. I was gonna complete the tear, fix it, uh, arthroscopic biceps, tenodesis, and application of the patch. With this patient, I did a two, uh, a double row repair. Immediately, I used two Annika X-twist anchors uh, over a lateral row, uh, five and a half uh, millimeter X-twist, one anchor laterally, actually. It was not a huge tear. Um, I got very good fixation. Given the patient's age, I decided to uh, augment this cuff repair with an integrity patch. Again, we see the lateral row fixation first. We mallet the staple in place. We roll out the patch over the repair. And then from there, you're able to mobilize this again with, with the staples, which I'm doing here. So a little bit easier. Sometimes it doesn't always deploy exactly where you want it. Um, and this, I find it uh, easy to easy to just manipulate the graft to put it where you want. Um,
I found using about four tacks is, is enough, uh, but you can easily use more. There's, there's 12 in the kit. <clears throat> My post-operative course is pretty much the same um, for rotator cuff repairs or subchromial de de decompression. When I do this alone without a rotator cuff repair or an augment, I treat it as a subchromial decompression. I allow early range of motion, sling for a day, begin physical therapy, post-op day one or two, no lifting restrictions, and they return to sport at about three months. If I uh, do a biceps, I usually keep them in a sling for two weeks, but I still allow for uh, early range of motion. Um, with a, when I do the augments, I start my patients on uh, um, physical therapy fairly early. I don't wait till six weeks, so I just have them moving it. Typically, like a like a general rotator cuff repair, I protect the protect it for about six four to six weeks. So my early outcomes so far, again, limited release. There's only I've only done 19 cases so far, which is which is a lot at this point. Um, longest follow up for me has been nine weeks. I have had no returns to the OR, no complications, and overall the the, the VAS scores have improved on my patients um, at least at eight weeks, six to eight weeks. And then lastly, some of the pearls. So um, for articular tears, I like to mark the, the tear with a needle from, from the um, subacromial space um, so that I can center the graft from when I go above. Um, when positioning the implant, I also ensure that it covers the defect and laterally, I'm able to put the staple in lateral to my lateral row. Um, and I position the cannula so that the staple enters the tissue uh, perpendicular to the tendon. Um, and I also keep this roller in place. So the roller, the, the delivery device comes with a, um, a um, uh, when you put the staple in, it comes with a, a the, the roller basically can uh, stay in place and close off the cannula. So it's it actually, it's easier if you leave it in position before uh, taking it out. Otherwise you get some backflow of the water through the cannula. Um, I also have found that it's easier to use an accessory portal for these tacks. Um, I don't see why you would use the same cannula. It's just easier for me to use a, a secondary small, small percutaneous uh, uh, incision. Again, this is a this scaffold is hyaluronic acid based, um, structurally sound implant, very good uh, tear resistance, easy to use fixation, um, and supports tissue regeneration and, and tendon healing uh, better than its competitors. I, I think it has very encouraging early outcomes, and I'm excited to uh, to see how it does uh, in the long term.